Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. Um, I am uh, the course director and fortunate to uh, be joined uh, by Drs. Feldman and Carver, uh, who will follow my presentation. Uh, none of us have any disclosures to make. The uh, learning objectives upon completion of this course, uh, you should be able to uh, cite uh, current concepts and controversies in the management of uh, both low stage and high stage uh, non-seminoma, as well as seminoma. Um, describe uh, the biology and the clinical implications of teratoma and uh, understand how to better utilize tumor markers in their role in diagnosis, follow-up, and decision-making. So to start off with some basic epidemiology, uh, there are approximately 9,000 new cases of testis cancer, resulting in about 400 deaths uh, per year. Uh, it is the most common solid malignancy in young men. It, the incidence has doubled over the past 40 years for reasons that remain unknown. The overall survival for testis cancer, all stages included, is about 96%. Most of these tumors are germ cell. About 4% are non-germ cell, Sertoli tumors, lytic cell tumors, um, stromal tumors. And a young man with a testis cancer has a 2 to 3% chance of developing a bilateral, contralateral, second primary in his lifetime. Risk factors for development of tumors. Uh, it's well known on the send the testis, uh, depending on what series you read, have anywhere from three to 14 times increased incidence. Uh, testis tumors are also more common in uh, atrophic testicles, in patients with a history of infertility or subfertility. And there is also uh, increased risk uh, among certain families, um, and there's a lot of work that's uh, being done now in terms of identifying genes uh, responsible for uh, germ cell tumors. Important in the management of any uh, disease uh, is understanding the special features of that disease. As uh, mentioned earlier, this is a young man's disease. And what that means is you, we're playing for the long run. These men are in their 20s and 30s, so you have to worry about uh, late toxicities, and Dr. Feldman will talk about this. You have to worry about late relapse, and Dr. Carver will talk about this. So we're not talking just two-year survival, five-year survival. We're looking 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Uh, these are very chemosensitive tumors. Uh, there's a very consistent pattern of metastasis, generally speaking. Uh, these uh, tumors uh, often produce uh, markers, AFP, HCG, in about 70% of cases. And this is a disease of differentiation. And you, um, they have the capacity to form teratoma. We're talking non seminomatous uh, germ cell tumors. The diagnosis uh, of a testis tumor unfortunately continues uh, to be problematic in that there is a delay in about a third of these cases. Uh, that has not changed over the past 30, 40 years. Any solid intratesticular mass should be considered a testis tumor until proven otherwise. The treatment is a radical orchiectomy. Ultrasonography, extraordinarily helpful, very specific, very sensitive. And you can see here's a hypoechoic lesion. It's vascular. And any hypoechoic vascular lesion is a tumor until proven otherwise. Who requires sperm banking before an orchiectomy? Most people will do it after, but some require it before the orchiectomy. Those with a solitary testicle, those with bilateral masses, 
those with a history of a contralateral orchiopexy or a contralateral atrophic testicle. All those should bank before the orchiectomy. Here you see an ultrasound with all these white spots. That's calcifications. This is microlithiasis. There's a, a misconception that microlithiasis leads to testis cancer, and that is not correct. Um, microlithiasis does not lead to testis cancer. This is probably the best study that studied uh, this issue. And in fact, patients with microlithiasis are at the same risk to develop testis tumor as the general population. You often find microlithiasis in orchiectomy specimens, but that's just microlithiasis sometimes lives in a bad neighborhood, but it does not lead to testis cancer. So how do these uh, tumors present? They can present either with local symptoms, a painful swelling, a hard mass, or they can present with symptoms related to metastatic disease. Most commonly is back pain due to retroperitoneal metastasis. They can find a uh, neck mass from supraclavicular adenopathy, a cough from pulmonary disease, GI symptoms, uh, CNS symptoms from brain metastasis, and about five to 10% will have gynecomastia. So what is required in evaluating uh, testis tumors? History and physical, ultrasonography, as I mentioned, is extremely useful. Markers, AFP, HCG, and LDH, and imaging, CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. PET scans, are not part of an initial evaluation. They are overused, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of radiation, and does not help. The only role for PET scan is in the post chemo seminoma and in very unusual circumstances. So PET scans are not part of the initial evaluation. MRI of the brain for anybody with neurologic symptoms or patients who have pure pure choriocarcinoma, because they, off, they will sometimes have brain metastasis that are asymptomatic. CAT scans of the chest add a lot to uh, finding disease that is not apparent on a chest x-ray. Here you see mediastinal adenopathy that is not apparent on the chest x-ray. Here you see a pulmonary nodule that again is not seen on a chest x-ray. So in our view, CAT scan of the chest is important, particularly in non-seminoma, less so in seminoma, but certainly in non-seminoma. You will pick up disease that is missed on chest x-ray. So the issue with CAT scans of the chest is you often find little tiny nodules, two, three millimeters, and then you're not quite sure of the clinical significance. The thing to do is to do nothing and to repeat the imaging in four to six weeks. And if this is disease, you can see that this nodule got larger and it will declare itself. So when there's a, uh, again, the imaging nowadays, um, the resolution is such that it picks up a lot of tiny little nodules. The thing to do is to just sit tight and repeat the imaging down the road four to six weeks. Tumor markers, and I just want to spend a little time on this because this is important, um, and I don't think uh, many people fully uh, capitalize on the potential uh, and utilizing and integrating tumor markers in clinical decision making. Tumor markers in this disease are critical in staging, monitoring response to therapy. You want to see how these markers drop, in monitoring for disease recurrence, and in predicting prognosis and risk directed therapy. And Dr. Feldman will, will address that in a little bit. So the markers we want to talk about, HCG and AFP, 
The key is HCG, the half-lives. The HCG half-life is 18 to 36 hours. There can occasionally be false positives. To rule out a false positive, you do a testosterone suppression test. You inject 300 milligram testosterone, recheck the HCG in 48 hours, and if it's gone back down to normal, you've had a false positive. About 10% of seminoma will have an elevated HCG. It is of no prognostic significance. The half-life of AFP, on the other hand, is five to seven days. And an elevated AFP excludes the diagnosis of a seminoma. So if you do an orchiectomy, it's pure seminoma, but the AFP is 200, you treat it as a non-seminoma. And again, you have to follow these markers post-orchiectomy until they nadir. And it, that sometimes can take a little time. This is an example of a patient who had an AFP of 3,400 before the orchiectomy, 650 HCG before the orchiectomy. And you can see that the HCG normalized in two weeks and the AFP took two months to normalize. If one had made clinical decisions before, they nadered, you would have uh, pulled the trigger too soon and started this patient on chemotherapy here when in fact he ended up being a clinical stage 1A. So you have to be very patient and follow these markers until they level off. If they fail to level off, in the normal range and the CAT scan's normal, then you have a clinical stage 1S and we'll address that in just a second. So again, the take home message here, and it's important, is follow these markers out until they plateau or until they normalize before making any clinical decisions. Um, just a few comments on choriocarcinoma. There's some misconceptions here as well. Choriocarcinoma in a mixed germ cell tumor, where it's 10% of the tumor, 15% of the tumor, the presence of choriocarcinoma is not an adverse risk factor. A pure choriocarcinoma, on the other hand, is very different. They will have very high HCGs, they will have a lot of pulmonary metastasis, and they will occasionally have brain metastasis. So pure choreo, very different than just a smattering of choreo in a mixed germ cell tumor. Teratoma, uh, we no longer distinguish between mature and immature. They both are histologically benign. There's no prognostic difference between the two. The issue with teratoma is you cannot predict the biology, who will grow, who will undergo somatic transformation. The presence of teratoma in the orchiectomy increases the chance of teratoma in a metastatic site, particularly the retroperitoneum. So let's start with clinical stage one. That means a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is normal. What are the goals? Low relapse rates, minimize toxicity, and few long-term sequela. So what are the options are surveillance, chemotherapy, and a bilateral nerve sparing node dissection. This is, we're talking about non-seminoma here. So the key is obviously patient selection and the proper execution of each option. So if you choose surveillance, you want to do it right, the right sequence, the right test, the right time chemotherapy, the right drugs, the right dose, and surgery, a proper operation. So stage one, you have 1A, 1B, 1S. Again, CAT scans are normal. The different 1S means that the marker failed to normalize. So if the markers fail to normalize um, after you followed them appropriately, 
that means there's still systemic disease and these patients require systemic induction chemotherapy. The difference between 1A and 1B tends to be vascular invasion or local extension. So the risk of relapse, again, we said that 1S have disease, they need to be treated. Difference between 1A and 1B is essentially if you watch, if you put them on surveillance, the risk of relapse essentially triples in 1B. So again, this is uh, talking about 1S. If you have markers that fail to normalize, that usually reflects occult systemic disease. And if you operate, they will have elevated post-op markers, so you've accomplished nothing. Elevated markers reflect systemic disease and require systemic therapy. So um, again, the survival of any stage one, regardless of the treatment modality chosen, should exceed 99%. So if we look at a study here, here we're looking at vascular invasion. These are 1B and no vascular invasion, which is 1A. You can see that the risk of relapse triples essentially from 14 to 44%. Most of the relapses tend to be good risk and Dr. Feldman will talk about the different risk categories. Um, this is time to relapse. You see that most relapses will occur within the first two or three years. Um, so that's when you really want to condense and your interval, interval of studies and so forth uh, are tighter, given that, again, more than 95, 98% of relapses are going to occur within the first few years. How are you going to pick up the relapse? You're either going to pick it up with a CAT scan or with markers. And that's true for both 1A and 1B. So that's really where the money is. And again, that's the time frame to pick up these relapses. So if you look at the guidelines, and again, forget about the minutiae, and you will all have this in your handouts, all these slides, the all guidelines with uh, the European, the EAU, the NCCN, they're all front loaded where the frequency of testing in terms of markers, chest x ray, CAT scans are front loaded to the first few years. And then as each year passes, you stretch out the interval between studies. So surveillance, option one for stage. Uh, one, the advantage of surveillance is you avoid overtreatment in uh, over 70% of patients, particularly the 1As. Uh, the disadvantage is uh, if they do relapse, they sometimes will require an increased burden of therapy. Uh, you have obviously more CAT scans, and you're relying on the compliance of young patients who are very mobile and not often uh, com compliant. So the optimal patient for uh, surveillance is a clinical stage 1A, no vascular invasion. However, half of 1Bs will not relapse either. So that's surveillance. Uh, second option is chemotherapy, which initially started with two cycles of BEP, uh, relapse rates of 2 to 3%. Now we use one cycle of BEP, relapse rates are about, again, 2 to 3%. However, about 10% of these high risk patients will have teratoma in the retroperitoneum. And remember, chemotherapy does not address. Uh, teratoma. So we, how much teratoma 
is present in the retroperitoneum in stage one, about 10%. So teratoma can occur even if there's none in the primary. Teratoma cannot be reliably excluded. And again, ter about 10% of chemo treated patients will have untreated teratoma in the retroperitoneum. Now, remember, we said that the relapse rates with chemotherapy are about 3%, but about 10% will have teratoma. So why is there this discordance? And the reason is because sometimes the follow-up is not long enough to pick up some of the uh, relapses. Some teratoma will, may never uh, relapse. And you cannot predict which teratomas will grow or undergo malignant transformation. Uh, chemotherapy, again, here's well-known acute toxicity in terms of nausea, vomiting, loss of hair, and the late and permanent sequela, and Dr. Feldman will talk about this, uh, a lot of tension here, and this tends to occur 15, 20, 25 years down the road. And these are important considerations, particularly since these are very young men. So the advantages of chemotherapy is that it reduces the risk of relapse to less than 3%. Uh, the disadvantages is, again, it overtreats many patients. It has long and short, uh, short and long-term uh, side effects. It does not treat teratoma, um, and therefore, teratoma poses some risk of late relapse, and late relapse can occur 10 years, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. The final option is a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, and RPLND is both a staging and a therapeutic procedure, but must always be done with therapeutic intent. Now, as you know, one of the side effects of a bilateral dissection was retrograde ejaculation, and the impetus for modified templates was to preserve antigrade ejaculation. That was the only driving force for modified templates. And the rationale for retroperitoneal uh, node dissection is that the lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum are often the first and only site of disease. These tumors reliably spread to the nodes first before uh, having distant metastasis. It is rare, less than 10% that will bypass the retroperitoneum and have lung or liver uh, disease without having retroperitoneal disease. So that's why in over 90%, the money is in the retroperitoneum. Now, RPLND is a, uh, is a significant uh, procedure with both acute uh, morbidity, and that's well known to uh, most of you, wound infections, atelectasis, um, chylosocytes, uh, about 1% or 2%, an occasional lymphocele, about 5%, 4 5% will have a major complication. Again, um, these uh, procedures um, are best performed in centers that have uh, a lot of experience. Uh, any pr procedure, all studies that have looked at outcomes and volume uh, show a clear correlation. Uh, Long-term sequela is about a 1% chance of a bowel obstruction and a incisional hernia. With nerve sparing techniques, retrograde ejaculation should be less than 5%. Um, we have seen, this is memorial data, a significant drop in relapse since 1999. And we attribute that to two things. One is better patient selection. We no longer operate with, uh, with uh, elevated markers, and we do CAT scans of the chest, and we find pulmonary nodules that we would not have found otherwise. And since 1999, 
we have abandoned modified templates and done bilateral templates. So um, again, we are picking up these tiny nodules that we missed before. We are not operating with elevated markers. We are doing bilateral operations with nerve sparing to, uh, and this, when you do nerve sparing, you are dissecting the hypogastric plexus, the postganglionic sympathetic fibers, and the sympathetic trunks. And you, if you do that, you don't need to do a template. You can do bilateral dissections, and therefore you reduce the risk of understaging and undertreating the retroperitoneum. People use modified templates and nerve sparing interchangeably. They are not the same operation. A modified template is a reduced template. Nerve sparing is identifying, dissecting, preserving these nerves, and doing a bilateral template. Everybody and their brother had a different uh, modified template. Um, there are several studies that show that there is significant extra template disease if you do a modified template. So again, we abandoned that in 1999 with, uh, in, with better results, fewer relapses. Um, here is a study showing uh, that total node count is important. This is the more nodes you, dice, you uh, resect, the chance of finding a positive node increases. So the concept is the more you look, the more you find. Uh, with 40 lymph nodes essentially doubling the probability of finding positive nodes. So we think a thorough bilateral nerve sparing operation uh, is uh, the optimal way to go in our view. Um, RPLND, again, advantages and disadvantages. You re reduce the risk of relapse. You minimize the chance of needing chemotherapy. You resect teratoma if it's there. Um, you don't need to serially image the retroperitoneum. The disadvantages, again, uh, you're overtreating a number of patients. Some will require postoperative chemotherapy, uh, and it's a big operation. So it should be done by surgeons who uh, are familiar with this procedure. Who uh, do we think benefits from post-operative chemotherapy after a primary RPLND? Those that have N2 or N3 disease, nodes that are bigger than two centimeters, more than six positive nodes, extranodal extension. If they're N1, the risk of relapse, at least in our hands, is less than 10%. It's about six to 8%. We observe these patients. Again, it's important that they should be NED post-op. If the marker is going up, then they are not NED. If you find a new nodule or a new retrocrural node, they are not NED. They, then they would require induction chemotherapy. That is rare with stringent patient selection, but it's important. Adjuvant chemotherapy is to prevent a relapse. If they have an elevated marker, you're not preventing anything, they have disease. So that's an important concept. Uh, a lot of controversy regarding minimally invasive surgery uh, because uh, those proponents show that it reduces morbidity, shorter hospital stays, quicker convalescence. But there are major concerns with uh, minimally invasive surgery in terms of therapeutic intent, therapeutic efficacy, given that most patients are using uh, chemotherapy in the presence of positive nodes, most are unilateral templates, and we're seeing very unusual patterns of metastasis that you do not see with open surgery, port metastasis, carcinomatosis, and so forth. Clinical stage two means that there is disease in the retroperitoneum. Um, 2A, less than two centimeters. 2B, two to five centimeters. 2C, greater than five centimeters. All 2Cs should have chemotherapy. Most 2Bs should have chemotherapy. So 
who should have RPLND and who should have chemotherapy with stage two. RPLND is ideal for unifocal negative markers, less than three centimeters, and no symptoms, no back pain, no flank pain. Chemotherapy for all two Cs, multifocal disease, anybody with an elevated serum tumor marker, um, and anybody who's symptomatic. So these are the patients who should have induction chemotherapy. All two Cs, symptomatic, contralateral, multifocal 2Bs, any 2Cs, and anybody with an elevated marker. So uh, important take-home messages, delay in diagnosis continues to be a problem. A solid intratesticular mass is a testicular cancer until proven otherwise. Sonography, extremely useful. Hypochoic vascular lesions, pathognomonic for a tumor. PET scans have no role in the initial evaluation of a germ cell tumor. An elevated AFP excludes the diagnosis of seminoma. Markers that fail to normalize, and again, remember to follow them out, usually reflect systemic disease and require systemic therapy. And we feel a bilateral nerve sparing operation reduces the risk of understaging and undertreating the retroperitoneum. So I will now turn this over to uh, Dr. Feldman, who will discuss uh, seminoma and advanced disease. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Joel. And it's a pleasure. Uh, once again, thank you to the AUA uh, leadership for allowing us to present this uh, course. I'm going to talk to you today about early stage seminoma and advanced germ cell tumors. So um, in terms of uh, seminoma, about 85% of cases are diagnosed in stage one. And because that's greater than the proportion of patients with non-seminoma who present in stage one. That makes stage one seminoma the single most common stage in histology combination, so the most frequent uh, patient you're going to see in practice. The treatment principles for stage one seminoma are as follows. There are three options. Uh, surveillance, which is really uh, heavily favored in the United States uh, and elsewhere. Radiation and uh, carboplatin. The survival is close to 100%, uh, greater than 99%, just like with stage one non-seminoma with uh, the options Dr. Scheinfeld spoke to you about. With all of these three approaches, the survival approach is 100%. The differences in strategy and approaches is basically in the relapse rates and the uh, potential late toxicities. An adjuvant strategy for all patients giving radiation or chemotherapy would overtreat the majority of patients and is associated with both acute and chronic toxicities. Surveillance is the least toxic to the entire population, but one must remember that this still requires frequent follow-ups, including CAT scans, that patients have to be compliant with follow-up, and they need to be able to cope with not being aggressive or having um, a, about a 15 to 20% risk of recurrence. And uh, in this very highly mobile demographic, uh, these are patients who are young men who are going uh, off to college, who are coming off their parents' insurance, who are starting new jobs, moving around the country, uh, we do lose some of these patients uh, to follow up. So in terms of the breakdown between the three options, surveillance, radiation, and carboplatin, you can see that the relapse rate is about 15 to 20% with surveillance, and this can be decreased to about 4% with radiation and about 5 to 6% with carboplatin uh, one cycle. However, uh, there is no advantage in survival uh, for either radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, the radiation uh, is typically given at a dose of uh, 20 to 25 uh, gray, and the carboplatin is usually one cycle or two cycles uh, at a fairly high, you're not familiar with this, but that's a fairly high dose in AUC of seven. The median time to relapse differs uh, in the approaches for surveillance. It's usually about uh, just a little over a year. Uh, same thing with radiation, but with carboplatin, it's a little bit longer. Uh, most of the relapses with all of the approaches are at less than uh, two years, although the long-term relapses with carboplatin are unknown. 
the percent of the relapses in the retroperitoneum greatly differs between the three options. So with radiation, you severely diminish the risk of, of recurrence in the retroperitoneum, but for carboplatin, it's almost the exact same um, as it is for surveillance. Most of the relapses are in the retroperitoneum. The survival, again, is great with all three approaches. And then the real key factor is the potential late toxicity. So uh, for radiation, which used to be the standard of care throughout uh, the entire world for stage one seminoma based on the uh, potential to reduce the risk of recurrence, we found out that after 15 to 25 years, there's an increase in secondary malignancies. And that is a twofold uh, increase. Um, and some of that can take 20 to 30 years. But again, we're in it for the long haul, as Dr. Scheinfeld mentioned, these are men in their 20s and 30s, and you're talking, or 30s and 40s, and you're talking about potentially getting these cancers at 50, 60 years of age. And there's some bad actors, pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, cancers that would be uh, harder to treat than a recurrence of the seminoma. So it's rarely used now, radiation. In terms of carboplatin, we don't really know what the long-term risks of carboplatin are, unfortunately. The data in the seminal papers only goes out to about less than 10 years, six to eight years of follow-up. And it can take, again, 15 to 25 years to see an increase in incidence of uh, uh, secondary cancers as well as cardiovascular disease and stroke. In one study, there was a trend at least toward an increased risk of stroke um, later on after carboplatin. So in general, um, surveillance is the preferred option by most guidelines. Um, it re results in the least uh, amount of late toxicity and uh, preserves uh, survival. Radiation is still in some guidelines, uh, but you need to discuss the risk of late uh, cancer uh, complications with the patients, secondary uh, malignancies. And um, if patients relapse after radiation, they will end up getting both radiation and chemotherapy, chemotherapy for their relapse. And that's associated with the highest risk of both secondary malignancies, other cancers, or uh, cardiovascular disease. And then risk-adapted carboplatin, uh, most patients, again, don't need it just like they don't need radiation, uh, as 85% are cured after orchiectomy. And we don't know what the long-term risks really of carboplatin are. So just a quick slide about stage 2A and B seminoma. So stage 2A can be treated with either radiation or chemotherapy. If you give chemotherapy, you give chemotherapy for good risk disease. You do need a higher radiation dose than what is given for stage 1 seminoma when it's being given in the adjuvant setting. So the, the dose here is 30 to 35 gray, including a boost to the grossly visible disease on imaging. The recurrence rate ranges from about 3 to 13% with radiation has been, in at least one study, shown to be only 0 to 5% with chemotherapy. So it may be less uh, with chemotherapy. And some, some uh, experts will prefer chemotherapy even for stage 2A. The downside for chemotherapy is it is more acutely toxic than uh, radiation is. Again, if patients recur after radiation, they will go on to require chemotherapy, and then have this significant increase, about a threefold increase risk of having of developing either another cancer or a cardiovascular disease. For stage 2B, uh, again, this is when lymph nodes are greater than 2, but less than or equal to 5 centimeters. 2A is when the lymph nodes are less than or equal to 2 centimeters. Uh, anyone over 3 centimeters should receive chemotherapy for advanced disease. Again, good risk. If they are between 2 and 3 centimeters, Chemotherapy is also favored, but radiation is considered an alternative. Uh, recurrence rate here is about 10 to 20%. As you get larger and larger in terms of lymphadenopathy, the rate of relapse with radiation goes up, whereas with chemotherapy, it stays basically stable. And again, a, uh, there is an increased risk of secondary cancers with both radiation and chemotherapy, but probably a little bit higher with radiation. This is the, the data I was referring to before that compares the incidence of second cancers and cardiovascular disease based on treatment modality. And what you can see here is that for patients who uh, would undergo surgery only, they have the lowest risk of developing secondary cancer or cardiovascular disease. Radiation or chemotherapy by themselves have um, uh, also an increased risk, but not as great as when you give radiation or chemotherapy together.
So moving on now to advanced germ cell tumor, um, I define this as any tumor that requires primary treatment with full course systemic chemotherapy, which essentially is three to four cycles of cisplatin-based chemotherapy, the main regimens being either BEP, EP, or VIP. As mentioned on the prior slide, for seminoma, this includes stage 2B and higher disease, and for non-seminoma, this includes stage 1S, so elevated markers, which indicates the presence of advanced disease, uh, marker positive 2A disease. Again, those are patients who are not candidates for primary RPOND. And then most stage 2B or higher, especially the ones that are over three centimeters, as Dr. Scheinfeld was mentioning. These patients are potentially curable even when they have widespread metastases, uh, as you, most of you know from Lance Armstrong's case, where he had 100 lung nodules. Uh, and even two brain metastases and was cured. Uh, initial chemotherapy is determined by the IGCCCG risk grouping. And it is very important that you get markers both pre and post orchiectomy, but one must understand that the markers after, after the orchiectomy and before chemotherapy are the ones that are used to determine the stage and the IGCCCG risk. So seminoma is very easy. Patients can only be good or intermediate risk. They cannot be poor risk with seminoma. Seminoma is always more favorable, and so we don't have poor risk for seminoma. If you look at the distinction between good and intermediate, it's basically the presence of organ metastases other than to the lung. So anything other than lung or lymph node metastases is considered a non-pulmonary visceral metastasis. That's what NPVM stands for. And if you have that, you're intermediate risk, and if you don't, your good risk. You can see here that we've had some improvement over time when the um, IGCCG was first uh, reported and published in 1997. Good risk patients had an 82% five-year progression-free survival. That's now 89%. And their overall survival has increased from 86% to 95% based on a recent uh, study. In addition, for intermediate risk, it's about it went from about 67% to 79%. For, for PFS at five years, and from 72% to 88% uh, for overall survival. So patients are really doing well, but there's still a significant difference in outcome between good and intermediate risk. And just to make the point that the marker levels and the primary site do not affect the outcome for seminoma, uh, specifically HCG level, and whether it starts in the mediastinum or starts uh, in the testis is no different for seminoma. Those patients uh, will both do well. It's only for non-seminoma where the primary site and the marker levels influence the prognosis. So moving on to non-seminoma, here is a little bit more complicated. We have three risk groups, good, intermediate, and poor. And to be in the good risk group, patients have to meet all of the following criteria. They have to have either a gonadal or retroperitoneal primary tumor. They cannot have non-pulmonary visceral metastases and they have to have low levels of their tumor markers in the S0 or S1 range. And you can see S0 is when the markers are normal, and S1, S2, and S3 are listed at the bottom of the slides with the cutoffs. Intermediate risk is the exact same as good risk, except that the markers are in the S2 level, S2 range. And then poor risk is any of the following. You do not have to meet all of the criteria. A primary mediastinal uh, non-seminoma is, by definition, poor risk. Presence of non-pulmonary visceral metastases makes one poor risk, and S3 level of markers makes one poor risk. Again, uh, there's been a migration over time and improvement in outcomes. Uh, in the 1997 paper, uh, the five-year progression free survival was 89%, it's now 90%, it's about the same, but survival did improve from 92% to 96%, probably as a result of uh, better adherence to treatment principles and uh, salvage therapy. Intermediate risk patients similarly had a small increase in their five-year PFS, 75 to 77%, but a more significant increase in overall survival from 80 to 88%. And then the biggest gain was made in the poor risk patients with an increase from 41 to 54% for five-year PFS and 48 to 67% for five-year overall survival, a very significant uh, increase. So in terms of the chemotherapy for good risk, the goal is to minimize toxicity and maintain the high cure rate since the outcomes are expected to be excellent. About 60% of patients are good risk and their cure rate should be over 90%. There are two standard chemotherapy regimens, 
either four cycles of etoposide plus cisplatin, which is called EP, or three cycles of bleomycin plus etoposide and cisplatin, or BEP. These two regimens have been uh, studied extensively at Indiana University for the BEP3 regimen and Memorial Sloan Kettering for the EP4 regimen. And when you compare uh, single institution studies, the outcomes are excellent and extremely similar in both groups, as can be seen on these virtually identical uh, Kaplan-Meier curves. So both are standard. There's only been one trial that has compared the two regimens, BEP3 to EP times four. The primary endpoint of the study was the favorable response rate. This was the Colleen DTUG study. And the, the primary endpoint was achieved in 97% of four cycle of the EP4 group and 95% for the BEP3 group. Uh, overall survival and four-year overall survival were not statistically significant uh, for the two arms. There were some uh, notable uh, problems with the study with dose intensity versus platin and etoposide being higher in the BEP times three arm than the EP times four arm. And there were more treatment delays with EP times four. And these factors may have caused some slight numerical uh, differences in EFS and OS. But the conclusion is that both of these are standard regimens for first-line therapy for good risk patients. And the contraindications to bleomycin where EP should be used include age over 50, uh, active or heavy ex-smoker or uh, renal insufficiency since bleomycin lung toxicity has increased in all three of, with all three of those factors. Just a couple of other uh, points about chemotherapy that are really important. Carboplatin is inferior to cisplatin. As you can see from this Kaplan-Meier curve, overall survival is decreased when you substitute carboplatin uh, uh, for cisplatin, and the difference is about 20% in this one study. Uh, the overall survival is also decreased with decreasing the cisplatin dose, as you can see here, going from uh, 125 milligrams per meter squared to 75 milligrams per meter squared uh, causes a significant decrease in uh, survival. The, the standard dose is 100 milligrams per meter squared. And finally, it's very important to note that the progression free survival is decreased with the etoposide dose, and even overall survival is decreased with etoposide dose. You can see here that even a regimen that includes more cycles of chemotherapy with bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin. So both of these are BEP, but one regimen with four cycles had a lower dose of etoposide than the three cycle regimen. The results are actually worse in the four cycle regimen because you lowered the etoposide dose. And that's why that prior slide I showed you comparing the two uh, regimens in the Colleen study, it's important to note the differences in the etoposide and the cisplatin dose uh, intensity. In terms of post-chemotherapy RPLND histologic outcomes, they're basically the same between the two um, uh, uh, groups. Uh, we found in our study that there was a slightly higher rate of teratoma after BEP, but the rate of viable cancer was the same between BEP three cycles and EP four cycles. And Dr. Carver will discuss more about post-chemotherapy RPLND uh, after I'm uh, finished. So just moving on to intermediate and poor risk germ cell tumors. Um, intermediate and poor risk comprises about 40% uh, of patients, about 20% are intermediate risk and 15 to 20% are poor risk. Uh, cure rates are much lower than with good risk disease, 70 to 75% for intermediate, 40 to 45%, uh, maybe up to 55% now in, in recent uh, years with, uh, uh, for poor risk. Seminomas are never poor risk, as I mentioned before, and the standard of care for this, uh, for intermediate and poorest patients is four cycles of BEP. So uh, three cycles of three drugs is not enough, and four cycles of two drugs is not enough. You need four cycles of three drugs. Uh, the uh, VIP regimen, etoposide ifosamide cisplatin, is an alternative that doesn't use bleomycin. That can be used for patients like Lance Armstrong, who's a professional cyclist, or those who have a contraindication to bleomycin. The reason we don't prefer it in all patients is because it's associated with more myelotoxicity, um, uh, suppression of the blood counts, need for transfusions, neutropenic fever, et cetera. There have been several randomized trials that have tried to improve upon four cycles of BEP, including using high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant in the first-line setting or alternating regimens. 
Unfortunately, all of them have been associated with increased toxicity and no improvement in outcome. So BEP four cycles remains the standard of care with VIP four cycles being an alternative. In terms of post-chemotherapy management, uh, for patients who have non-seminoma and a residual mass, they get surgery, especially if the retroperitoneal lymph nodes are over a centimeter. Um, and those with seminoma, we typically do a CT scan. If the, if the size of the residual lymph node in seminoma is over three centimeters, we get a PET scan. If it's under three centimeters, we observe the patients. If the PET scan is negative, as most of them are, then the patient can be observed. If the PET scan is positive, then um, further evaluation is necessary. The one point I wanna make is that if you have viable tumor at the time of surgery, seminoma or non-seminoma, so let's say the patient has a residual two centimeter mass, you remove it and there's a mixture of teratoma and embryonal carcinoma. They have, for that embryonal carcinoma, they need two additional cycles of chemotherapy, usually with a toposide and cisplatin. Same thing if they had seminoma and they had had a post-chemo RPOND, which is rare in seminoma, but if it's done, uh, that's what they need. So moving on to salvage chemotherapy, uh, these patients are still curable. About 50% of them can still be cured, which is really distinguishes germ cell tumor from almost every other uh, advanced malignancy. The chemotherapy options we have to salvage these patients include conventional dose chemotherapy, which I abbreviate as CDCT, and high-dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant, which is abbreviated as HDCT. Uh, in addition, I'd like to note that surgery after salvage chemotherapy is vital due to the higher rates of viable germ cell tumor that you find uh, as compared to first-line therapy after first-line therapy, and because if the patient recurs again, they are very unlikely to be able to be cured with systemic therapy, and so the stakes are even higher after uh, salvage chemotherapy. You're out of systemic options. So in terms of conventional do, uh, salvage chemotherapy, the most common regimens used are either the VEIP regimen or the TIP regimen, but most regimens are ifosamide plus cisplatin plus a third agent. The TIP regimen uses taxol as that third agent or paclitaxel as the generic term, and the VEIP regimen uses vinblastine or velvan as that uh, third agent. In terms of the outcomes, the complete response rate is about 50% and the durable complete response rate is about 25% with initial salvage, either VEIP or VIP. Um, this was evaluated in patients, all comers who had stable disease or better to first line therapy. The prognostic factors for outcome amongst uh, patients given salvage conventional dose chemotherapy include the primary site, which is um, if it's gonadal or retroperitoneal, that's much more favorable than having a mediastinal primary site. The response to first-line chemotherapy, if it's a CR or a PR with negative markers, meaning all the disease, all the markers have normalized, but there's still evidence of disease on imaging, um, that's better than having stable disease or an incomplete response. Disease-free interval lasting of greater than six months is favorable, less than three months is unfavorable. Having elevated HCG or AFP over 1,000 uh, is unfavorable, and then the presence of liver, bone, or brain metastasis is, is unfavorable. The most important two are the gonadal retroperitoneal versus mediastinal site and the degree of response to prior therapy. With that in mind, at MSKCC, we evaluated the TIP regimen, again, paclitaxel, ifosamide, cisplatin, in patients who were, we consider to be favorable. That is, they had a gonadal primary tumor and had achieved a CR or a PR negative markers lasting at least six months after initial chemotherapy. And you can see here the results were significantly better than what I showed you previously. Uh, prior results were again 50% CR rate, 25% durable remission rate. Here, 70% CR rate, 63% durable remission rate. So TIP could be better than these other regimens, but there was selection bias in this study and there's no randomized data to compare one conventional dose regimen versus another. In terms of high dose chemotherapy, this consists of two parts. One part where we mobilize the patient's own hematopoietic stem cells that usually hang out in the marrow, in the bone marrow. We get them into the blood and we collect them, either using chemotherapy or just using Neupogen, GCSF. And then we give them two to three cycles of high dose chemotherapy and rescue them after each cycle with their own autologous stem cells as well as uh, Neulasta or Neupogen. Um, the drugs that are used for the high dose portion are carboplatin and etoposide. Those are the two most important drugs. Uh, 
and the major toxicity is myelosuppression, which the stem cells and the growth factor help overcome. Uh, so um, in terms of whether con conventional dose chemotherapy or high-dose chemotherapy is preferred as first salvage, there's only been one randomized study. That study, as shown on this slide, found no difference uh, in outcome with one high-dose chemotherapy uh, cycle added to three cycles of conventional dose salvage chemotherapy compared to four cycles of conventional dose chemotherapy. Unfortunately, this study only used one high-dose cycle, and most of the regimens that have been effective have used two or three cycles, so it really doesn't exclude a benefit to sequential high-dose chemotherapy. Uh, patients who had incomplete responses to first-line treatment who we know don't do as well with conventional dose chemotherapy were excluded, and more than a quarter of the patients who were assigned to the high-dose chemotherapy arm did not receive that arm, uh, did not receive that high-dose chemotherapy cycle, which undermines these results. Uh, in contrast, retrospective studies um, have shown that patients fare better with initial salvage high-dose chemotherapy compared to conventional dose chemotherapy. Two-year PFS rate was 50% versus 28% in the largest study, and overall survival 53% versus 41%. So as a result, there's an ongoing randomized clinical trial comparing uh, TIP to TICE, that's the conventional dose chemotherapy, to a high-dose chemotherapy regimen in all comers who progressed after first-line uh, treatment with an uh, endpoint of overall survival. And I encourage you to refer any patients who you see who have relapsed after first-line chemotherapy to this study to try um, you know, and help us complete the accrual. We're about three-quarters of the way done. And this will be the uh, trial that defines the standard of care in the future and makes up for the inadequacies of the prior study I mentioned. So just to finish up in the last uh, two minutes or so, um, Toxicities from germ cell tumor treatment are uh, extremely important and factor into decisions earlier in the disease, uh, um, um, or in earlier stage disease. You can see here what the toxicities of cisplatin are, uh, kidney toxicity and neuropathy, as well as ototoxicity. Etoposide mainly causes lowering of the blood counts and bleomycin can cause vascular toxicity in terms of Raynaud, dermatologic toxicity, and uh, of course the most feared uh, lung toxicity. It's important to note that with increasing number of cycles, uh, as you go from, it's a blacked out here, but as you go from uh, EP, uh, uh, sorry, BEP one cycle to EP uh, four cycles and then BEP three cycles, there's an increased incidence of cytopenias, pulmonary toxicity significantly increases from four cycles of EP at 2% to 4% with three cycles of BEP and then 16% with four cycles of BEP. And then, um, sorry, uh, treatment-related death is very rare with BEP3 cycles or EP4 cycles, but increases with BEP4 cycles. So this stresses the need to stratify the patients correctly and treat them correctly. You don't want to give, you don't want to over-treat patients with good risk disease with four cycles of BEP, for example. In terms of uh, paternity, uh, fertility, as Dr. Scheinfeld mentioned, it's very important to do sperm banking. Fertility is affected by um, all uh, management strategies with the exception of uh, surveillance. Um, there's a minimal risk with RPLND if the patient develops retrograde ejaculation, but sperm banking can overcome that. Uh, but radiation and chemotherapy both reduce the risk of, or both reduce the ability to father a child naturally from about, um, you know, 80% down to 60, 70%. And then after salvage chemotherapy, paternity rates are very low at under 40%. Uh, there is leukemia risk uh, with etoposide. And that risk is there even um, at very low doses of etoposide. So one or two cycles of BEP could still lead to an increased risk of um, leukemia from etoposide, but not as great as with four cycles of BEP. And then vascular toxicity, there's an increased risk of myocardial infarction and coronary artery disease in this population after getting cisplatin-based chemotherapy, as well as risk factors for heart disease like elevated uh, cholesterol, hypertension, um, and metabolic syndrome and obesity. So with that, take-home messages I'll just uh, finish with. Germ cell tumor, remember, is highly curable. The goal is to minimize toxicity but maintain the high cure rate, especially for good risk disease. The two regimens that we use for good risk are EP4 cycles or BEP3 cycles. Um, for intermediate and poor risk patients, we use four cycles of BEP. Remember that cisplatin is superior to carboplatin and that the doses of cisplatin and
etoposide are very important to outcomes. Relapse, relapse after first-line chemo can still be cured with either conventional dose or high-dose chemotherapy. It remains unclear what the preferred strategy is at this point because prospective randomized studies found no difference in outcome, but retrospective studies favor high-dose chemotherapy. If the patient has viable tumor after first-line chemotherapy, then they should receive uh, two cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy if they have viable tumor at surgery. And then uh, the toxicities of chemo can be both uh, can be acute, chronic, or late. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carver uh, regarding the um, post chemotherapy RPLND. Uh, thanks, Darren. Uh, so as Darren mentioned, uh, the management of metastatic non-seminomous germ cell tumor uh, incorporates a multidisciplinary approach with risk-appropriate based chemotherapy, followed by complete surgical resection of all sites of disease. And there is broad consensus uh, for patients that have uh, normalized their serum tumor markers following chemotherapy and have residual masses greater than one centimeter, as shown here. This is large volume retroperitoneal disease that these patients should be managed with complete surgical resection, including a bilateral post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. And following post-chemotherapy uh, retroperitoneal lymph node dissections, the histologic findings in the retroperitoneum uh, represent fibrosis or necrosis in approximately 50% of patients. Approximately 40% of patients will harbor teratoma or teratomatous elements. And approximately 10% of patients will have residual viable germ cell tumor. And as Darren mentioned, these are the patients that would be treated with two additional cycles or adjuvant cycles of uh, etoposide and platinum, uh, assuming they have normal serum tumor markers following their post chemotherapy RPLND. It's important to note that with refinements in chemotherapy, the incidence of viable germ cell tumor has decreased over time. And most of the controversy with regards to management of the retroperitoneum following chemotherapy is centered on patients who have a complete radiographic response, those particularly with residual lymph nodes that are less than one centimeter on their post-chemotherapy CT scan. And this is an example of such of a patient. Um, he initially started off with uh, 2B disease, uh, inner aortic cable adenopathy was treated with chemotherapy. Following the chemotherapy, he had a complete resolution based on his CT imaging. And in general, the smaller the lymph node that's present or residual, the greater the controversy there is. So the controversies in the management of post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph nodes center on several questions. One is a negative retroperitoneal lymph node pathology an optimal clinical endpoint? What is our ability to reliably predict a negative retroperitoneal pathology pre-surgically? What are the consequences of false negative predictions of fibrosis? And the assumption that we can achieve comparable patient outcomes with timely and appropriate treatment at disease relapse following surveillance. And if we're going to perform a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection on these patients, what is the extent of the retroperitoneal surgery that should be done? Uh, resection of mass, modified templates, bilateral RPLND have all been done in the past. At Memorial, our gold standard is a bilateral retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. So is there therapeutic benefit for performing a post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection and having the finding of fibrosis. Uh, and indeed there is, uh, this is seen in several different studies, uh, one of which is in patients who are undergoing post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection uh, following multiple chemotherapy regimens and still have persistently elevated serum tumor markers, uh, the, quote, desperation, retroperitoneal lymph node dissections, it's important to note that approximately 15% of these patients uh, will have a negative histology or the uh, histologic finding of fibrosis uh, 
and yet 90% of those patients will normalize their serum tumor markers, indicating that there is obvious pathologic sample error that can occur, particularly within large volume retroperitoneal disease. Additionally, several studies have demonstrated that the more extensive a negative post-chemotherapy RPLND is, the less likelihood there is of relapse. And we can see this by looking at uh, subsets of patients who have undergone bilateral retroperitoneal lymph node dissections versus unilateral modified templates versus resection of mass only. These are all patients who had the histologic finding of fibrosis alone. And we can see that the risk of recurrence is significantly less in patients who undergo a bilateral RPLND. Additionally, if we use lymph node count as a surrogate of completeness of uh, resection, of extent of surgical boundaries, we can see that with increasing number of lymph nodes removed in the setting of fibrosis, the risk of suffering a disease recurrence is significantly reduced. This is an example here of a patient of ours uh, who underwent uh, EP times four for a clinical stage 2A S1 non-seminominous germ cell tumor, uh, was noted to have a uh, very robust uh, clinical and radiologic response, underwent a bilateral retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, and within a five millimeter node, there was a small microscopic focus of residual teratoma. Multiple series have demonstrated that approximately 30% of patients will have residual disease, even with post-chemotherapy post residual masses less than one centimeter. Uh, you can see the breakdown here for those patients with uh, residual masses less than five millimeters. The incidence of teratoma is about 15%, viable germ cell tumor about 5%. And for those uh, with residual masses between 5 and 10 millimeters, the incidence of teratoma is 30% and viable germ cell tumor 6%. So the other approach to managing patients who have a complete radiographic response has been surveillance. And this has been highlighted by two studies, uh, one of which was from Indiana University. It's important to note that in this study, it also included patients uh, who had clinical stage 1S disease. And as Joel mentioned earlier, this is a subset of patients that are clinical stage 1. They have no radiographic evidence of uh, retroperitoneal disease or other sites of metastatic disease, but have persistently elevated serum tumor markers. And those patients are managed with systemic therapy. Additionally, it's important to note that this was a select cohort of patients. About 75% of the patients in the study had no evidence of teratoma in the primary tumor. And we know one of the biggest predictors for having teratoma in the retroperitoneum is having teratoma in the primary tumor. And the median follow-up of this study was 15 years. Uh, several of these patients, unfortunately, succumbed to their disease. But overall, uh, the risk of uh, relapse on this surveillance study was approximately 6%. When they looked at predictors of disease recurrence, they saw that patients who started off with intermediate and poor risk disease had a higher rate of recurrence. So the management of residual masses less than one centimeters uh, in the post-chemotherapy setting, uh, we see that multiple series uh, where RPLNDs were performed are uh, reporting uh, histologic findings of teratoma or viable germ cell tumor in approximately 30% of cases. For the two observation studies, the risk of relapse was approximately six to seven percent. So as Joel mentioned in the primary setting, when we look at surveillance, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy or RPLND, there's discordance with regards to histology and uh, disease uh, relapse rates for patients on surveillance. And so as Joel mentioned, one of the biggest issues we face with teratoma is that it has a very unpredictable biology. Uh, it is chemo-resistant, 
Uh, it can display rapid growth as well as uh, dedifferentiation into secondary somatic malignancies or malignant transformation. And complete surgical resection is uh, the standard of care for treating uh, teratoma. The difference between the histologic finding of teratoma and the relapse rates on observation uh, is likely due to insufficient follow up. We know that late relapse, approximately 30% occur beyond 10 years. And we've seen, as Joel mentioned, uh, late relapses out to 30, 35 years. And then additionally, because of the unpredictable uh, biology of teratoma, there's clearly a subset of teratoma that will be inert, uh, will not grow or develop secondary somatic malignancy. However, our ability to predict which ones will be problematic and which ones will be biologically benign uh, does not currently exist. Additionally, the incidence of non-teratominous germ cell tumor also exceeds the retroperitoneal relapse rate. And this is predominantly due to the fact that we often use adjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy regimens that can mask uh, recurrence. Uh, and additionally, often our uh, use of serum tumor markers for surveilling patients will allow us to detect a recurrence before we can see one radiographically. So what are the consequences of an unmanaged uh, retroperitoneum? Uh, clearly, there are two major um, consequences. One is the potential for late relapse, and the other is the potential for the development of secondary somatic malignancy associated with teratoma. Late relapse has traditionally been defined as relapse beyond two years, although the vast majority of these patients uh, have received prior chemotherapy and therefore have chemotherapy refractory disease. The retroperitoneum is the most common site of late relapse, and approximately 60 to 50 percent of patients uh, who suffer from re late relapse do so beyond five years. Unfortunately, the uh, overall survival and disease-free intervals associated with uh, late relapse of germ cell tumor are uh, relatively poor. The management of late relapse uh, is really focused on getting these patients to a complete surgical resection. For patients who have solitary focus of disease, uh, normal serum tumor markers, uh, often resection when it is achievable is performed as their initial management. For patients who have multifocal or unresectable disease or positive uh, serum tumor markers, uh, we will uh, refer these patients for uh, chemotherapy, uh, which will hopefully allow us to get them to a complete surgical resection. This is the case of a patient of uh, Joel's um, who initially started off with 2A good risk disease, received four cycles of EP. Uh, you can see he had a nice uh, radiographic response to his chemotherapy. This patient refused surgery uh, and subsequently went on to develop a late relapse and retroperitoneal recurrence. Uh, this did demonstrate secondary somatic malignancy with uh, differentiation to sarcoma. Uh, at that time, as you can see, his HCG was elevated and he did receive a TIP times four prior to his surgery. And then the other consequence of an uh, untreated uh, retroperitoneum is the risk of teratoma dedifferentiating into secondary somatic malignancy. Uh, we see uh, histologic evidence of secondary somatic malignancies across the disease spectrum of germ cell tumor. In the setting of a primary RPLND, that incidence is less than 1%. In patients undergoing post chemotherapy RPLND, uh, following induction chemotherapy, that incidence is approximately 3%. And in the setting of late relapse, the incidence jumps up fairly significantly to 20%. Secondary somatic malignancy always originates from an unresected teratoma. These patients are typically managed with surgical resection, and chemotherapy is tailored to the dedifferentiated subtype 
Uh, so we typically do not use um, uh, standard germ cell uh, chemotherapy regimens for these patients, but rather tailor that to the histology of their transformation. So weighing the best risk and benefits of post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection versus surveillance for those patients who achieve a complete radiographic response uh, following chemotherapy. Uh, both of these options are now standard, but we really need to take into account both the short, intermediate, and long-term risk. Surveillance results in fewer operations, less perioperative morbidity, less need for expert surgeons, uh, does require long-term imaging of the retroperitoneum. If we're going to consider surveillance, uh, you should take into account whether or not there is teratoma in the primary tumor. For patients with teratoma in the primary tumor, they might not be ideal candidates. And based on the Indiana data, perhaps this should also be limited to good risk disease as patients who had intermediate and poor risk disease had a much higher risk of disease recurrence. With RPL and D, this reduces the risk of the retroperitoneum as a site for late relapse, uh, the risk of developing secondary uh, somatic malignancy, secondary to unresected teratoma, uh, reduced risk for salvage chemotherapy, and reduced risk uh, or reduced need for retroperitoneal imaging. And of course, the best outcomes uh, are if patients are managed in centers of excellence who have a high experience in treating uh, patients with uh, metastatic germ cell tumor. So the criteria to pre fibrosis currently remains unreliable with approximately 25 to 30% error rate. In our opinion, retroperitoneal pathology is merely a surrogate endpoint and clinical outcome, long-term clinical outcome remains paramount. Meticulous follow-up and timely intervention at disease progression or relapse, unfortunately, may not result in comparable clinical outcomes to that of an immediate post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. And retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in the post-chemotherapy setting is a critical component uh, for the management of patients with advanced non-seminomatous germ cell tumor. So if we're going to recommend and perform a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, what should the extent of surgery be? As Joel mentioned, uh, modified templates were originally developed in the clinical stage one primary retroperitoneal lymph node uh, setting. Uh, these have subsequently been adapted to the post chemotherapy setting uh, with the goal of preserving anti ejaculation. However, as Joel mentioned, with bilateral nerve sparing techniques, this kind of obviates the need to do modified uh, templates and it allows us to uh, appropriately stage and treat the retroperitoneum. So looking at extra template disease or disease outside the boundary of modified templates in the post chemotherapy setting, what we see is that anywhere from four to 30% of patients, uh, both on right-sided modified templates and left-sided modified templates, have disease that extends beyond the borders of a modified template. Uh, importantly, in patients who have residual disease that is less than one centimeter, the quote, uh, radiographic complete responders, approximately 15% of patients will have disease outside the boundaries of a modified template. And the histologic distribution of in-template and extra-template disease is virtually identical. So if you have viable germ cell tumor in the template, you have viable germ cell tumor outside the template and the same with teratoma. Looking at our group of patients who have undergone nerve sparing post chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, what we see is approximately 70% of patients overall uh, will uh, recover anti ejaculation. Uh, size of the tumor uh, is uh, prognostic in one being able to achieve a bilateral nerve sparing technique and two with regards to recovery of um, integrated ejaculation. Uh, we recommend bilateral nerve sparing techniques in the post chemotherapy setting uh, when it does not compromise 
oncologic efficacy. And in addition to managing the retroperitoneum, we also have to take into account other sites of disease, uh, extra retroperitoneal sites of disease. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, the goal is complete surgical resection of all sites of residual disease. The most common site of extra retroperitoneal disease is the lung followed by the mediastinum, the liver, and the neck. The histologic discordance between the sites is approximately 30%, and having fibrosis in the retroperitoneum uh, does not equate to having fibrosis at an extra retroperitoneal site of disease. We can see that approximately 20% of patients who have fibrosis in the retroperitoneum will harbor either a teratoma or a viable germ cell tumor at extra retroperitoneal sites. So the take home messages, uh, post chemotherapy surgery is indicated for all patients with residual masses. Patients with a complete radiographic response should undergo an ARC pre L&D with observation reserved for select cases and bilateral infrahyalar templates uh, should be performed uh, with nerve sparing techniques when appropriate. And so with that, I'll thank everyone who attended this. And if Joel and Darren want to come back on, we have a time, we have some time to review some of the questions. All right, hey, Joel, do you want to comment on how you follow someone or manage someone who has um, a contralateral microlithiasis? after undergoing an orchiectomy for a germ cell tumor? Um, if it's just microlithiasis, again, depending on how anxious these patients are sometimes, we'll get um, serial imaging. Um, now, my, microlithiasis is very different than macrolithiasis, and assuming that there's a normal echo pattern. Again, what makes them at risk at, at higher risk for a contralateral tumor is the fact that they had an initial tumor, not the presence of the microlithiasis. So that's an important concept. So we'll get uh, maybe annual ultrasounds um, and we probably will stretch it out uh, over time. These patients by virtue of having had a uh, an initial tumor, are uh, pretty good about self-exam and um, you know they'll report anything unusual um, often. The second primary usually uh, tends to present at, in general lower stage again because these uh, these patients tend to be checking themselves. And uh, Darren, do you want to comment is there any role for immune checkpoint inhibitors in patients uh, with poor risk germ cell tumor, as anyone looking at immune checkpoint inhibitors in uh, high risk salvage settings, so forth? Yeah, so excellent question. Um, there's been one study of uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab in patients who uh, progressed after high dose chemotherapy. It was done at Indiana University and it didn't show any responses, and that sort of tempered the enthusiasm for these drugs in. Uh, patients uh, with refractory germ cell tumor. However, uh, we do have a study of a combination immunotherapy program going on in MSK using the two drugs, Dervalumab plus Tremolimumab. And, um, you know, so if patients, and that's again in the refractory setting, we would have to show some activity first there before we would be able to move it forward into the first line high risk setting or even uh, combining it with high dose chemotherapy. But uh, we're still continuing to explore uh, that concept. And Joel, as part of initial staging, uh, do you prefer to get your CT imaging done before or after the orchiectomy? Are there cases where you would uh, push an orchiectomy before you could complete staging? Usually, most of the time, we'll do the CAT scan after the, um, after the orchiectomy, because usually you'll do the orchiectomy, you'll see the patients a week later, um, and you, when you discuss treatment options, you, you want to have as fresh data as you as you can. So if you tend to do them before the orchiectomy, uh, 
by the time you have a discussion, the CAT scan's uh, two weeks old. Um, so I, I don't, it, I find it more useful to do it afterwards. Um, occasionally, and this is important, and when you're considering somebody for orchiectomy, you wanna make sure that you palpate the cord and it, you, uh, you examine the inguinal canal. You wanna make sure you can get a clear margin along the cord. So if there's bulky disease, or if you feel like a sausage type tumor up the cord, Sometimes orchiectomy uh, is not indicated. You won't get a clean margin. You'll be cutting through tumor. There, we'll get a CAT scan and, um, and manage the patient uh, without an orchiectomy, either based on markers, imaging studies, or possibly a, a needle biopsy if uh, oncology requires uh, tissue diagnosis. So just an important point you know, regarding the orchiectomy. And uh, although extremely rare, I think maybe I've seen one, uh, and you may have seen a, a couple of more, uh, the risk of having a, a retroperitoneal bleed following an orchiectomy resulting in uh, hematoma mass effect in the retroperitoneum is, is very rare, but something that should be recognized if, if one comes across it. Right, so if, uh, if uh, you know, sometimes you'll see scrotal hematomas, they tend not to be a big deal, they'll resolve on their own. But if you lose a vessel uh, in the proximal cord and it gets away from you, you can have a significant retroperitoneal bleed. Um, you usually will see a drop in the hematocrit, but most people will not be checking post-op uh, hemoglobins. And what you'll find is a retroperitoneal mass, and that's easy to confuse with uh, retroperitoneal disease. And there have been reports of patients being treated with chemotherapy for what in fact was a retroperitoneal bleed. So really during the orchiectomy, uh, losing the cord uh, or a vessel in the cord, um, you know, is, is, is a, a very, very rare, but a bad problem. And uh, one last question, uh, Darren, I know Joel covered this in depth, uh, but how long do we wait for serum tumor markers to nadir after an orchiectomy? As long as they're uh, going down, I would continue to follow them until it either plateaus or rises and uh, would be less concerned about, about the time. If they're continuing to go down at a pretty steady rate, uh, I think there's a bigger risk of over-treating the patient and causing unnecessary toxicity than any uh, detriment from uh, waiting until things declare themselves. Yeah, I'm glad that Brett brought that up as a final point because uh, my experience has been that possibly the, the single uh, area of most confusion and, and uh, has been in in, in terms of uh, integrating markers and using markers properly and optimally. And you really wanna wait till the markers so normalize or plateau and you, you follow them as long as it takes. Uh, I think that's a good way to, uh, to end this session. I think uh, our time is up. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the participants for a great job. I wanna thank the uh, the AUA, uh, Aaron and uh, Sarah and uh, the staff are uh, setting this up and all participants. Thank you very, very much.